Well, I'm going to start out with this picture that some of us in exoplanets really want to do. We want to change the way that people see our world. And for many people, like myself, and depending on your age, you were born in a time when exoplanets were only science fiction. And now anyone born in the last 15 years, for them it's just normal when they learn about science and the world around them to understand that exoplanets are out there and we have real evidence of them. And we want to move that a step further so that sometime in the future we can take people, I can take you, or younger people. I was hoping it would be my children, and I'm sort of thinking that would be my grandchildren, out to a dark sky and to point to a star in the sky and say that star has a planet just like Earth. And that's what my series of lectures is trying to convey, where we're at in exoplanets and how we're going to get to this kind of time. And I also, I know you're a self-selected group, and I still want to start out with why study exoplanets. You probably all are interested, and that's why you're here, but I still want to give you a bit of justification. Let me pause for one second. Do you think we could get the lights on the room before we had our presentation? Yeah, yeah. Because I don't want anyone to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> right, so why study exoplanets? We actually have two reasons. One, you're going to be able to guess, and the other one, you might not see in the same way or haven't thought of yet. The one that you could probably guess of is our more practical one. We want to inspire the nation. We hear from people of all walks of life, children through any age, interested in exoplanets. And we're hoping that this will help draw more people into science and technology. We don't want all of them to work on exoplanets, but we do want them to come into science and technology to train them and to help our nation continue to lead the world in technology. You know, this is a problem here in America, and we hope that exoplanets can do its part to address this issue. STEM education, etc. The real reason why we work on it, why all, all scientists, I think, do what they do, is really curiosity. And in exoplanets, we're particularly excited because we really believe that 1,000 years from now, when people look back at our 21st century society and ask what are the most significant accomplishments of the time, what are the things that have lasted 1,000 years, one of them will definitely be exoplanets. Because it's true that we collectively are the first generation of humans who were able to find planets around other stars. And we hope that we're going to be the first ones to find planets like Earth that have signs of life on it. That's our real motivation. And that's why I work on this field and why I'm so pleased to be here to tell you about exoplanets. Does anyone recognize this planet? Hmm. It looks funny. I'm sure you all think you recognize it, but I want you to look one more time. What's wrong with this planet? It looks like Earth, right? But actually, too much land, right? And this is an artist's conception of an exoplanet. I like this for two reasons. One is related to one of my later talks, and that is it really doesn't have that much water. Water is actually bad for biosignatures. It's good for life, but bad for biosignatures because when water gets photodissociated by starlight or sunlight, the OH radical, it's called the garbage eater of the atmosphere, and it tends to destroy a lot of gases that might be signs of life. That's why I like it. But I also like it because it epitomizes exoplanets for me, for me and for others in that you know, we'll never see this kind of detail. In an exoplanet, we're not planning to do this any time in the next, you know, few months, next foreseeable future. Exoplanets will just look like points like this, like stars. We won't be able to spatially resolve the surface. So the point is that we'll never see this kind of detail, but how much detail is enough detail? That's what we face in exoplanets and all astronomers face, trying to get enough photons and information from distant objects. And that's part of the, those are part of the themes of my talk, the themes of exploration, of trying to find new things, trying to use limited data to learn and solve fundamental questions. So as part of my, I'm, I have a few just very introductory slides. And is, what's really interesting about exoplanets is how diverse they are. We expected perhaps to find planets like Jupiter and like systems like our own solar system, but they are actually quite different. This is actually an artist's conception. The credit is from Sean Raymond, another astrophysicist, who actually did simulations to see what kind of planets and in what kind of order. That's not so important for this moment, but just to show that you could expect very different solar systems with very, very different types of planets. This one's supposed to show you our solar system, not to scale though. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and showing you other ones that perhaps don't have Jupiter, ones that perhaps have a Saturn, etc. So in exoplanets, in astronomy, I'm showing you now a real photograph of a galaxy. Uh, for those of you who aren't in astronomy or physical sciences, a galaxy is a collection of stars bound together. And we believe that our Milky Way looks like this galaxy, because we can see our Milky Way from outside and that our sun is approximately up here. And I show this to ask you, uh, well, there's a couple of related questions. And one is, this is the interactive part of the lecture, how many of you believe there are other planets like Earth out there somewhere in our, our galaxy? 
In your self selected groups, I expect every single person to take that. <laughs> but a harder question is, and this is actually for my second lecture, how far from Earth, assuming that our Earth is right here where the sun is, do you think we can find planets that are like Earth? And by like Earth, I mean we'll see ones with signs of liquid water oceans and signs of gases in the atmosphere that are signs of life. How far away do you think we can see those? And you're welcome to just shout out an answer, which I'll repeat for everybody else. How far we can see now? How far we can see now? I didn't give you enough background information. I just wanted you to think about this a little before I told you the answer. But typically, we see planets uh, probably halfway to this center. Um, sometimes we can see them in other places, but mostly we see them kind of around here. But for Earth, so you know what? If we want to find a planet that we call like Earth, it would be actually also within this red circle, and we would really only have about 100 sun-like stars at our disposal. So even though there are likely, every star likely has planets, and many of them probably have Earths. The ones we could find and say that are really Earth-like are very nearby. And that's, that's part of the story about how we are really uh, trying to pioneer everything. So it seems like every star should have a planet. And in fact, our founding fathers believe that. In the last, just this, the past few days in Massachusetts, where I live, we've celebrated the start of the Revolutionary War. And so there's reenactments and, and a lot of things going on. So it's sort of nice to revisit what do people think. It seems logical that every star should have a planet. But you know, for scientists, seen as believing that nobody will believe it until you actually find those planets. And that would be the first part of my talk today. And down here, there's a little scientist joke if you're an astronomer. We have this thing we call it Venus of Earth. Everybody wants to know how common are other Earths? Does every star have a planet like Earth? And it's really imperative that we know because it'll shape all of our future space missions and also ground-based efforts. So they're kind of joking that back in 1803 they should have written a paper that said Venus of Earth is one. It's a big at the time. So for today, what I'm going to talk about, discovery of exoplanets. I have a, what I call discovery phase <coughs> two, which is going to focus on basically the last year, characterization, and then just some of my own personal thoughts for what we're going to do next. So to do this, I'm actually going to use this graph, which I'm going to explain. And I know you're a mixed audience. Some of you are scientists. Others are English majors. So I don't have too many graphs in my talk. But what I'm showing here is semi-major axis. This is distance from the star at Earth units. So one is here. Earth is one astronomical unit away. And this is mass in Earth axis. And so for the people who aren't so familiar with astronomy, you can think of this as increasing distance from the star. And this axis is just increasing mass for a bigger planet. Both are somewhat comparable. So I'm starting out here in 1995, and this is when the first exoplanet around the sun-like star was announced. We also had a smattering of other things. Of course, we have our own solar system planets, Mercury, Mars, Venus, Earth, there's uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. We had a few pulsar planets, planets around dead neutron stars that are beaming out very deadly poisonous radiation. But I'm trying to set the stage here to tell you about the last basically 15 or 20 years in exoplanets to capture a few of the themes of my lecture series. So first of all, what I want you to see is that this planet here, called 50 k it's the same mass as Jupiter. I mean, the same mass, same size as Jupiter, but look, it is closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun. And this was actually really interesting at the time, because if you make a discovery like that, you really want to be sure about it before you make an announcement. And this group apparently had sat on it for one year, trying to figure out whether it really was a planet or whether it was really something else. In 1996, the next year, I started working on exoplanets. And this was a time of great excitement, but also one of great skepticism. Many people didn't want to believe these were planets. We couldn't see the planets directly. We only see the gravitational effect by looking at the star. The planet and star orbit the common center of mass, and astronomers are able to measure the motion of the star, indicating the planet of a certain mass and distance from the star. And honestly, most in scientists, we want to be skeptics. It's the best way to approach it. But most people would not believe they were planets, changing this whole paradigm of believing that Jupiters are very far from the star, not so close where Mercury should be. This was challenging, very challenging at the time. And of course, there were a core group of people who really did believe that. Now, I'm going to skip by kind of five-year intervals. By the year 2000, the population of exoplanets had grown. And by this time, there were two kinds of people that I met. One was ambivalent, but not skeptical. And those were the people who would sit in the front row. <laughs> and they would come to me after and say, this is so interesting. If I were much younger, I would work on it. And I'm not sure if they would, but at least they were not skeptical. They were more or less ambivalent, and those people were interesting. The rest of the people were still very skeptical. By now, everybody believed that exoplanets were exoplanets, because some they were found too far from the star to be explained any other way. 
we made a special one here in green, and I call it green. It's a transiting planet. I'll come back and talk about what this is later. But basically, it's a planet that goes in front of the star seen from Earth. And it's pretty hard to explain it any other way when combined with another type of measurement. And so that, you know, you should believe it. You should be excited. Other techniques were starting to come into play. Uh, but people would say, well, you have only one transiting planet. This is a one object, one method, success story. And I would say, no, actually, we're going to have way more. We'll have hundreds of them later. But people really didn't want to believe this. And at this point, I just wanted to say that in exoplanets, we have had a really exciting couple of decades. And it's based upon individuals who work for 10 years or more in obscurity. And people constantly tell them, you can't do this. It will never happen. And they work for 10 or 15 years. And then the technology comes to fruition, and more planets are found. Now, at the time, I personally was working on a transit survey. I was one of many groups. And I knew what it was taking and how things were progressing. So I knew we would have more transiting planets. I wasn't just saying that to be a bold optimist, but I knew it was going to happen. So people were still ambivalent about whether this field was really going to succeed. By 2005, more and more planets were being found. And this was also a significant time for exoplanets. You see here we have several transiting planets. There's other techniques coming into play. And throughout the series, I will talk a bit about some of the techniques. <coughs> Okay, the point being is the diagram is starting to fill out, and uh, it looks like exoplanets are here to stay. The red circles represent planets with uh, detected atmospheres. So the best thing about exoplanets is that new techniques come to fruition not in a lifetime, but in about 10 to 15 years. By 2010, see where 2010? 2011 is similar. You can see even in the first few months of 2011, we have a lot of planets. So here we are in 2011. And if you didn't understand the axis of the graph, you could just see the whole, whole figure so not populated with exoplanets. And it makes so that this is one of my absolute favorite figures in all of science. And what I like about it is that the planets, they fill almost the entire diagram. It's safe to say that where you don't see planets is where technology can't reach yet. And what this means is that planets of any mass or orbit exist. That's like rolling the dice, but your dice doesn't go up to six. So double sixes, you can have any number. And we think this just speaks to the nature of planet formation, the random nature of planet formation, that in a disk of gas and dust around stars, planets form in a random way, and they grow bigger and bigger. And they also move around in the disk, such that really anything is possible in exoplanets. That's what we see here in this figure. And you can also see the different techniques, just by the different symbols, occupy different parts of the diagram. 